I go. So good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here uh, online. As I was uh, telling Tatiana early, I'm really sorry if you're not live in Venice. I would have liked to welcome you in person, but um, I mean, online will have to do for now. So let me start by thanking, uh, first of all, the network of the New Directions in the Humanities and Professor Jose Luis Ortega and my colleague, uh, Professor Anna Morbiato. And, um, and also Dr. Uh, or Professor uh, Portnova for reaching out to me uh, a couple of times already. So thank you very much. Now, I will start by, um, by thinking about the question that Anna Morbiato launched this morning, which is what directions are worth pursuing, what new directions are worth pursuing in the um, humanities, are worth exploring in the humanities. And as I was thinking about this over lunch, I thought that a possible answer could be one that uh, sees historical phenomena in a transnational perspective in order to diffuse uh, and demote nationalist narratives and constructions. You see, I come from the field of Israel studies and Israel-Palestine studies, and so I'm quite saturated with um, history as a tool of national constructions. And so this, um, uh, this, opportunity, this conference was for me an opportunity to uh, look into the methodology and the world of transnational history, which uh, carries enormous potentials for an enormous potential, I find, for um, present for for finding new histories that um, uh, histories written on the paradigms of national countries uh, tend to overlook. Um, so the subject of those presentations are Baghdadi Jews um, that, uh, as you can uh, imagine, I guess, from the title, uh, came from Baghdad, but not only from Baghdad. This is a group of Jews that uh, moved from um, the broader Middle East, let's say from Syria and um, Iraq, towards India and then China. I'll show you a map um, later between the 1730 and, and 1945. Um, and it's interesting to see how their identity and their um, identity as declined in terms of religiousness, in terms of use of language, in terms of clothing and food, um, changed as they inhabited these different diasporas in which they lived, uh, in which they lived and raised new generations. Uh, that is, um, uh, in fact, India and China and uh, Burma, um, apologies for using this colonial term, but this was the world that they were inhabiting, um, and um, all the way to um, Japan. Now, the question is how to reconstruct this web of relations, and one possible um, answer is, wait, I'm not sure this is going. Uh, wait. Can I? Sorry, it's not moving. Uh, I think on the bottom you got some narrow to get to the next one. No? Ah, there. I just have to click on the. Okay. Sorry. Oops. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, um, as I was saying, one possible way to look at this transnational web of relations between these groups of Jews. We're talking about 15,000 people. Uh, I mean, a community that grew up to 15,000 people by 1945 is through their press. Um, and as you can see here, there are four uh, journals or magazines, um, newspapers from India, which I intended to study during the months of April and May, because I was supposed to be in Israel, at the National Library of Israel. And that was my plan to study these uh, journals. Unfortunately, I could not move from here. And so um, what I, my plan B was to look at the journal that I had been already working on, which is the Israel Messenger, which is this one, which was published in Shanghai from 1904 to 1941. And what I, instead of like basically cross-referencing this um, Jewish press between India, China, and um, Burma, uh, what I, the only thing I could do was to find um, cross-references and uh, of this transnational experience in what was the journal that was published for uh, the longest time, which is in fact the, um, the Israel uh, Messenger. 
Uh, this is a first cover of 1904, and the second one is changes in 1919. There will be further um, evolutions of this cover. We'll see them um, later. Um, as I was saying, I'm not only, I was not, when I started devising this paper, I, I thought I was not only interested in the relate the commercial of family relations, transnational relations between members of this group, but also in how the generation changed. Um, and uh, as you can see from this is a very famous picture from, um, from this gentleman from Calcutta 1910. And you can see already that there are quite some differences in the generation. This is a grandfather with two grandchildren. And if you look at the way of dress, uh, it already um, basically signifies uh, quite, um, quite well uh, the kind of um, transformation that these generations were. Uh, going through by living in, in, in different countries. But as you can also see, the transformation is not towards being uh, like assimilated to the Indian, um, to use a broad uh, term, um, community, but rather towards the British model of, um, um, well, certainly of dressing. Um, and this is another element of this Baghdadi uh, community that keep, glues this group of people together, whether from India, Burma, China, and so on, which is their attempt to become as British as possible. Um, despite the fact that, I mean, this, all this was happening in the broader space, uh, transnational space of the British Empire, of course, and these family accumulated, many of these family accumulated immense wealth following the trades uh, and the, the imperial uh, networks um, of, the, of the British Empire. Um, and so uh, despite that they tried to be as British as possible, they actually were never quite uh, considered as white as the British were to um, use, uh, to introduce an element of um, skin color, if you like, um, as well in, in, in all this um, equation. Um, so just to summarize, um, these were the this was the transnational, sorry, sorry, this was the transnational network here um, of the Baghdadis. Uh, that in 1720, the, the pool factor that uh, pulled many of them out of the Middle East were actually um, commercial opportunities. Uh, and this was an immigration wave, the yellow one, that lasted for about one century. But then a second larger one took place um, uh, in the, in, in, from the 1830 onwards. And there was also a push factor here because the new governor of Baghdad, Daoud Pasha, um, had initiated a number of anti-Semitic policies whereby some of these families just decided to leave. And so, as you can see, they followed the roots of their predecessors, but then expanded further, much further um, east. Um, as I said, this expansion occurs along the roots of the British imperial and commercial phase. Um, and so, uh, it, it's interesting to see how this group of Jews could thrive economically because they disappeared basically as a collective marked by, um, you know, by, by a certain ethnicity. Uh, they disappeared into the variety of other groups and of other trading diasporas like the Parsis, for example, uh, in India and later on expanding eastwards. But at the same time, it's interesting to see that they maintained rigidly uh, a sense of uh, self-righteousness and of uh, being the normative Jew, um, which put them in conflict with all the other Jews that they found along their ways, because there were Jews in India, for example. There were Jews like the Bene Israel, that were a community of Jews living in Bombay, for example. And I will not get into the details, but for I, I will just give you an anecdote, but it's true, they had, the, 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 the Baghdadis had um, a wall built in the, in the Jewish cemetery to separate the plots between themselves and the Bene Israel. So I think that there could be no more definite sign of wanting to separate yourself from others, despite the fact that you have been thriving in the diversity of the place where you uh, landed. So uh, the category, category of diversity, which is one of the buzzwords, if you like, of these conferences and, and of this um, reasoning about transnational spaces, 
was really used in a, uh, in, a, in, in, in a commercial way, if you like, for a group that wanted to disappear in a diverse environment, in a multiverse environment, but was, um, on the contrary, um, refused uh, in order to assert, assert again one's own um, um, identity and not to be confused with, um, with others. Um, I'm just going very um, fast, but it's, um, I, just, I also maybe want to mention that um, Judeo-Arabic was also, um, um, Judeo-Arabic was, wait, sorry, I'm here. Judeo-Arabic was the language uh, that, um, that this group spoke. Uh, at least the first two generations only communicated in the commercial um, books and in their correspondences in Judeo-Arabic. And this clearly put them in conflict, uh, introducing an element of class, uh, also with all those whom they employed, because they employed in administrative and ruling positions only those who came from the same tradition and spoke the same language. Uh, but at the same time, they uh, employed um, local Jews and non-Jews um, in subordinate positions, which, as I said, introduced an element of class, which is rather problematic. And, but to remark the transnational and translinguistic experience of this group, if you look at this tag from the mills of one of the daughters of David Sassoon, which is one of the founders, this guy here, one of the founders of this dynasty, uh, David Sassoon, you see here. Um, as you can see, this tag is written not only in English, but also, uh, I believe, in Gujarati and Farsi and Arabic or maybe Urdu, I'm not sure, because that's the, 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 that's the script, but I don't know the language. So, But it's interesting that this is the kind of circulation that this kind of material would have. And if you look at the adverts that they, um, you know, that they published, um, represented in every empire country and all over the near, middle and far east. So we're talking about um, a very ra a rather large transnational um, space. There are also other examples in which there was um, um, a connection, uh, a deeper connection with the local societies in which they, but that is lived. And we can come back to this if you like. But in general, I would say that diversity was exploited to, or, or used to melt into the society economically, but refused in order to uh, maintain um, a division. Um, another point or another um, uh, methodology uh, that one or perspective or lenses that one could use to study the Baghdadis is not through only diverse, not only through diversity, but also through the uh, lenses of the family, um, family as an institution and as a, an institution that um, fosters, um, that has a, that that promotes several um, several factors. Um, if we look at the pages of this journal of the um, Israel's Messenger, um, the family was entrusted with at least three um, tasks. First of all, keeping alive the Baghdadi heritage, passing it through the generation. So, for example, brides were often chosen from Baghdad to join uh, a groom in Bombay or in Shanghai or in, in, uh, in Mandalay and so on. Um, the family was used, to, of course, to foster family, sorry, business relations, um, expanding eastwards all the way to Japan and westwards all the way to London. Um, and, um, and, and it's interesting to see how the journal became also a site where news of these transformations of the families um, across this transnational space were announced. So, for example, announcements of weddings uh, or the um, announcements of a birth or of a circumcision, regardless of, this, of, of where this was taking place, whether in London, in Bombay, or in, uh, um, I don't know, in, in Singapore, for example. Um, the same for relocation, for reasons of work or marriage, uh, or announcements of retirement, or um, in a very, um, um, in a very, uh, interesting, uh, with a very interesting cut, I would say, 
um, it's, it's interesting to look at obituaries as a form of collective memory. Now, there is a book by uh, Bridget Fowler, um, which, uh, sorry, this one, the last one, um, forget about the other two books, uh, The Obituary as Collective Memory, uh, by, which speaks, which is of 2007, which speaks about the obituary, at least, you know, the obituaries that you see in the British tradition in newspapers, um, which, which speaks about um, uh, um, an article that tells how society wants to imagine itself. So I'm just going, I mean, this obituary is on the journal, on the Israel Messenger, um, um, changed and became more and more articulated in the 1930s. But I will just read you a very short excerpt from 1905. And uh, you will see here all the buzzwords that uh, speak of this transnational family spaces. Um, so this is the obituary of Mr. Ruben David Sassoon. Uh, died in London uh, on the 8th of March, 1905. So the obituary says, and I'm quoting, on the 8th instant, telecommunication was received from the London office of Mr. David Sassoon and Company Limited to their branch in Shanghai, announcing the death of Ruben David Sassoon. He was the fourth of the 11 sons of the late David Sassoon by his second wife and was born at Bombay in 1834. On receipt of the news of his death, the flag of the opium receiving ships were put at half mass. Mr. Sassoon was a great personal friend of King Edward VII. The deceased was about 70 years of age and regret will universally be felt by Jews, especially in India and the Far East, at the passing away of Mr. Sassoon, whose house, with the capital H, is so well known for charitable benevolence and useful influence on behalf of the Jewish people. So this text really contains all the buzzwords that we need is the London office, the Shanghai branch at the professional level, the ships of opium uh, carrying, you know, a flag at half mast, the birth in Bombay, the death in London, um, the Baghdadi lineage, the son of David Sassoon, great friend of the king, like aristocratic um, legitimization, and, and so on. So um, when we talk about families, actually, um, it's interesting that um, the problem is that this Jewish history of this family East in the Far East have been written very often through the prism only of the family, but of single families, not as interconnected ones. And uh, you see here this founding volume by Cecil Roth. Cecil Roth is a very famous uh, and important historian, who also wrote, for example, the history of the Jews of Venice. Um, and this book came out in 1941, which is exactly the year that the Israel Messenger stopped um, publishing. Um, and so this imprinting, in a way, uh, of the history of the Jews in the Far East as a family of dynasties and economic dynasties or dynasties uh, was actually um, uh, was actually uh, can be attributed to this uh, to this volume. While on the other hand, if we look at this uh, other one on the left, the familiarity of stranger, this is a way of doing family history in a transnational way, looking at as it says here, cross cultural trade um, at the importance of families in uh, handling commercial trades in given hubs. And this is a little bit, the story that I'm telling is a little bit the same thing, but not in Livorno or in, uh, in, um, in the Livorno-Portuguese connection, but more um, eastwards. I don't know if I have another five minutes or maybe not. Yes, okay. So I will um, deal with the third point of looking at this, um, um, at this history of the Baghdadis uh, with these contradictions between identity generations and so on. So the third point is nationalism, as I said. Um, and this is very interesting because this community, uh, which as I said, had reached in 1945 about 15,000 people, this community thrived and, and I mean they accumulated immense wealth. We're not talking about uh, small uh, entrepreneurs, we are talking about huge um, fortunes. Um, so they could do this because they were moving in a transnational space. 
it's not in a space where, and, and this was a geographical and legal transnational space. That was the space of the British um, Empire. However, when um, the 20th century starts, they also fall prey to the um, lure of nationalism, if you like. And the nationalism for which they fall is Zionism. Um, okay, I'm not going to get into what is Zionism, what's colonial, not colonial, secular colonial, all these debates which concerns um, the Zionist movement uh, rather than the perception or the vision that the Baghdadis had of it. Okay, but if you want, we can um, go back to this point uh, later on. What is interesting is that Baghdadis uh, bought uh, in full the narrative of uh, Zionism and um, they uh, donated very liberally uh, to uh, the Zionist movement and they um, uh, placed their transnational network at the service of the national cause. None of them bought land in Palestine, none of them moved to Palestine. Uh, you know, Zionism at the time was uh, talking about the regeneration of the Jews through the tilling of the soil and through socialist communes. This is not the kind of public uh, that could hear any of that or would be interested in any of that. Um, these were trading in precious stones, they were investing in real estate, so it's a completely different world. But they were liberal in their giving. Um, and uh, they treated, for example, regally um, all the emissaries of the Zionist movement, which is a transnational phenomenon per se, being these um, usually American or um, Eastern or Western European um, emissaries of the Zionist movement that traveled to raise funds. Uh, and sometimes they sent distinguished guests. So for example, here you have Albert Einstein arriving in Singapore. Um, to raise funds for the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, of which he was a board member. And next to him, this is Menasse Mayer, who was the president of the Abagdadi and a president of the Jewish community of Singapore, who uh, basically, and his daughter, who donated, um, I can't remember how much money, but quite generously for uh, the, um, for the establish, for the building, for the, to contribute to the Hebrew University. Um, and so did other, um, other um, Baghdadi Jews, for example, oh, sorry, Laura Kaduri, no, go too far. Laura Kaduri, Kaduri was another Baghdadi Jewish family, and La Laura Kaduri was um, a member of this family, and she also donated for the Hebrew University and she donated her collection of Asian art to the establishment of the museum, of a future museum um, in, in, in Israel. It's called the Eretz Land of Israel Museum. But it's interesting because at the same time as she donated for the Hebrew University, she also donated for the establishment of a girls' school in Baghdad, of which you see here um, a photo on the left-hand side and um, a commemoration after um, she, um, she died. Um, I should mention that these families were different. They were not all the same. I've been treating them as a collective, but they were different and they were also rivals uh, in building the, the most beautiful building, in uh, investments, in donations, in balls, in uh, receptions. Uh, we're talking of, of a very, um, uh, of a very um, well-off um, part of society. So um, here again, we find another contradiction uh, because transnationalism and nationalism do not seem to, go, to be so uh, um, um, in contradiction one with the other um, because these group of Jews remained uh, very profoundly transnational when uh, all this experience in, in Asia ended because of 1949 with the establishment of the Chinese um, Popular Republic in China, or uh, the, the proclamation um, of, um, of, of the Republic of India, and so on. They just moved to England, or to Australia, or to the United States, or to Hong Kong, which they continued to refer to as the colony, um, following the British um, custom, I would say, of the 
20s and, and so on. Um, so, but they bought into this Zionist um, ideology or vision also because from 1922, Britain was given a mandate over Palestine. And so for them, it seemed that uh, Britain could be in the best possible um, place. I mean, the Jews would be in the best possible place to see the realization of the uh, national home, as the Balfour Declaration had said, because this mandate had been entrusted to Britain. This was an illusion that was clearly shattered in the 1930s, but this is how, I believe this is how the contradiction between nationalism and transnationalism can be in part addressed. So uh, what can we take home, let's say, from this story? I think it's a great story of um, ma majority minority relations in a way. Um, and uh, it is very relevant in terms of Jewish history, uh, where uh, there is usually a domination of an Ashkenazi, meaning Eastern European and American today, um, interpretation of things. It is also very useful because um, it helps disentangle the um, the enmity or the connect the the, the, the Arab Jewish um, terms. I mean, these are usually terms that are seen as in contradiction because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and because of other reasons. But this whole story tells us that there can be an Arab Jewish identity that keeps living on even if. This, the people that leave it are, um, you know, uh, leave elsewhere. So I think this is also um, important. And I think it's interesting because when you go to China and India today, um, you see, um, excuse me, you see buildings and, um, one second, doesn't work. You see buildings, I was saying, that. I don't know if you have been to Shanghai, for example, but this is a major, um, a major um, building in the landscape of the city, and it's still there with the red flag on it, you know, flying on it. But this was, for example, one of the buildings of the Sassoons. And the same goes for India, where you have this amazing library built in Bombay. If the slides go on, it doesn't seem to go on. Uh, and so forth. So, um, in a way, it's a past that I think, I personally think it's worth digging and bringing out. But then I will leave it to you, and I, I, I'm sure I went overboard with the time, so I apologize. But thank you very much for bearing with me. Thank you.